Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Raguse McBain, VP of Global Channel and Digital Strategy at the JS Group. And I'm here today to talk to you about my channel journey. I've been working in the technology channel ecosystem for the past 17 years. But when you ask yourself the immortal question of what did I want to be when I grow up, the question did not resonate in the world of technology. And so it's been my life mission to help promote women and diversity into pursuing, staying, and getting promoted in careers in the tech sector. So here's my personal journey. My family immigrated to America. My grandparents came here and they were the first in the family to pursue an American dream. I do have one other grandmother who was actually born here and she was Native American. But other than that, we have had people pioneer here and decide that they wanted to learn about the opportunities. Many of them did not go to college. Um, many of them had labor intensive jobs and or um, opened up small to medium businesses. It was the heart of an era and every generation wanted better for the generation after them. My mom raised me by herself as a single parent. And as we went through this journey together, she encouraged me to pursue anything that I set my mind to. So as a mother of four daughters, that is exactly what my goal is to do with each of them. When I went to college, the first in my family, I decided to pursue a career studying global business and marketing with a minor in peace studies, which I joked was make a lot of money and give it all away. My goal was to be philanthropic and have ethical three stools to business, meaning that anything I do can help change the world. The career that I pursued upon graduation was working on Wall Street. And I remember saying to the person who hired me, but what if I lose all their money? And he said to me, well, it's not your money. Why do you care? And I couldn't sleep at night with that answer. So I quit. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And luckily for me, my college decided to have an alumni event where they invited the top students of our small private school to come together and meet alumni who had graduated. One of the gentlemen reached out to me, um, though most of the people there really just connected with each other. Uh, and so I was very happy that he took the time to ask me what I was studying, what I wanted to do. And he asked me, so could you sell me a router? And I said, I don't know what a router is, but if you teach me, I promise I can learn and I promise I can sell you one. And he said, that is the right attitude. That's the right answer. So he told me about a little program that was called the Cisco Global Academy. This gentleman ended up being the area vice president of Cisco. His name was Lou McAlwain, and he was my original mentor. And so I will start the conversation here by saying, Mentorship matters. To have inclusivity, you have to think beyond people that look like you. If you're looking at the boardroom and everyone across the table looks, sounds, acts, or thinks like you, you're at a deficit. So the ability for this gentleman to think of this young girl who came from a lower socioeconomic background, who was the first in her family to go to college, who was the first to have an opportunity to think about working in a career in technology. And at the time, Cisco's program, key term was said, we are changing the way the world lives, works, plays, and learns. And I thought, wow, that's such an aspirational lofty goal. Can I be a part of something that helps change the world? And that is exactly what technology does. So I was very excited. Um, the first three interviews happened over the phone. I did very well in those interviews. And then they flew you to what I would call speed dating interviewing. You would get into a room filled bustling loud with noise and chatter. And they would say something to the effect of, you have uh, five minutes to answer these questions. A bell will ring and you have to get up and go to the next table. And if all three people didn't approve of you, you would not get the job. And for every one opportunity you were striving for, 800 people were competing for that opportunity. So it was highly competitive and highly driven. And the first two interviews went really well. And my third interview, the gentleman picked up my, my resume and scoffed and said, I don't think you're the right candidate for this job. And I looked at him and I smiled and I said, I think you're wrong. Can we go on with the interview now? And we went through the whole interview. And at the end, I said, do you think I'm the right candidate for this position? And he said, 
I think you were the right candidate when you told me I was wrong. So never take no for an answer is my other uh, golden rule, especially when in sales. Um, I was then offered two different opportunities at Cisco. I could become an engineer or I could go in sales. So I had one year of training where I was engineer, engineering certified in my CCSE, my CCDA. And then I also had six months of intensive sales training. And during that time, you had no opportunity or no idea where you were going to end up. So the whole goal was they chose people that were two years out of college, regardless of age, but you had to be two years out of college. So you were still in that, I'm a sponge soaking up and learning things. And at that time, they would send you anywhere. I opted to stay in North Carolina, uh, which was a lovely area. And I remember attending our first global sales meeting, 32 thousand people from around the world showing up, sitting in a giant stadium bigger than a concert, and John Chambers walked on stage, and we were in awe of this person who just spoke so articulately about the vision and mission and how our technology was changing the future, how we're enabling telehealth where you can save lives, how we were enabling the environment, how we're enabling people to work from anywhere, anytime, and stay connected around the world. The mission and the vision were very very critical, and also the philanthropic efforts and the ability to feel connected to something greater than yourself. At that end of that assembly, everybody dispersed as if nobody was left in the room. And three of us, ASRs, we called ourselves, ASRs, ASEs, wandered down to the front of the stage just to look out into the bleachers. And there he was, our CEO, John Chambers himself. And of course, young motivated people staring in awe of this visionary leader. And he looked over to us and he said, y'all must be my ASRs. Come over here for a second. And we just looked. And I've never been short for words in my life, but I slowly meandered with my friends. And he said, what do you think of our company? What are we doing right? What could we do better? And so at this time of my life, I learned one of the most important qualities of a leader is no matter how high you are in an organization, you make everyone feel included. You make everyone feel heard. It was the most paramount decision-making, life-changing moment of our lives because this person who is the highest person in one of the wealthiest co uh, companies in the world was asking what we would consider ourselves to be the peons of the organization, what we thought. And to feel included and to feel like we had a seat at the table to hear our voices was game changing. From that day forward, I went on to many different roles in the organization. Um, I did sales for several years successfully, but I decided to try some other things. I became a relationship uh, manager in the channel for Quest, CenturyLink, Embark, and Savvis, really learning a lot about our telecommunications and mergers and acquisitions. I then went on to work for Ingram, where I was advanced and promoted to manage Ingram globally in the channel, our largest distributor. So I got the opportunity to work with unique people and have diverse conversations every single day. And it was one of the most um, beneficial moments of my career uh, because you truly learn that we are in a global economy. And I love this quote by Aristotle who once said, I'm not a citizen of Athens or Greece, but of the world. And at the end of the day, we're all more alike than we are different. And we want to have that success and drive, but really it's having the ability to listen and learn from each other. And one of the things that would traditionally happen in our community is our company was headquartered in California and I was located at that time in New York. And met, most people do things on U.S. time zones if you're a U.S. headquarter company. And I'm sort of an insomniac and I would say, you know what? I'm going to do my best to meet you at your time zone because I don't think it's fair and I want you to feel included and desired and appreciate it for all you're doing as well. So sometimes I would host meetings at three in the morning just so people didn't have to be up in the middle of the night because I equally wanted to have that same expression of leadership and gratitude. And so servant leadership is one of the most core principles that I can advise when you want to make your team feel that you truly care about them and be in very authentic and genuine in that. Uh, from there, 
uh, I had this unique opportunity. I, I worked also then in public sector. Uh, and so we had incredible um, waves that we made in the technology channel. And Cisco was consistently rated the best place to work. At the same time, Office Depot and Toys R Us were rated the top two companies to go bankrupt, which was very nerve wracking. And of course, we all know how that ended for Toys R Us. But something unique was happening. Jerry Smith, who came from Lenovo, obviously a tech company, became the CEO of Office Depot. And they wanted to take a 30-year-old 30 30 brick-and-mortar retail um, company and turn it into a tech services company. So I was commissioned to come aboard and help lead the change. And I became the Senior Director of Technology Services, managing that op um, acquisition of CompuCom and really helping to pivot the company as a whole. And I think that sometimes one of the greatest learnings that we can take is to see an opportunity and seize it. Some people say, fake it till you make it. I don't like that term. I prefer the term, own it till you hone it. I could have spoke myself out of that opportunity, as many people do. Many women tend to experience imposter syndrome, and men do as well. And it's that ability or fear to say, do I have all of the qualifications needed? Have I checked every single box perfectly? Or am I going to learn as I go and use the skills and superpowers that I have to really lean in and shine? So, I raised my hand, I took the opportunity, and I helped lead our company to become one of the only um, parts that really helped pivot and turn it into the green, which was an incredible accomplishment and something I'm so proud of in my journey. But then something else happened. My mentor, Janet Shines, decided to open JS Group. And JS Group was a channel consultancy. And in this woman-owned business, um, and just a fun fact, there are more leaders named John than women in leadership. Um, Jan has always been an advocate and champion for women. So she decided to re-emerge her company, which she once had, and it was acquired by Motorola, and decided to reinvent and reimagine a place where we can save the channel. And so coming aboard to do something again that I've never done, which was channel consulting, taking all of my skills and superpowers and reimagining them to really help vendors and distributors and channel partners survive and thrive. That became even more important during the global pandemic. We have spoken about digital transformation for years. I've sold digital transformation for 17 years, in fact, and yet Overnight, a light switch went off. And in fact, a year before the pandemic, we trademarked the term digital normal because that is the way the world is evolving. And if you look at the channel ecosystem, there is this uncanny ability for you to truly understand the ecosystem as it exists today. The ability that prior to COVID, 44% of people did not work from home. And overnight, that suddenly changed. People had the ability to decide if they wanted to work from home, that they were going to be productive, be efficient, be effective. Companies cobbled together solutions. They figured out security. They figured out multi-cloud, hybrid cloud from a server world, and they made it happen overnight. Every company truly became a tech technology company. And so with this incredible whirlwind, we know the genie is not going back in the lamp. There is a new future of work. And what was ever pressing and ever challenging during that time was how do traditional channel people, salespeople and marketers learn to reinvent or reimagine the way they do business. And this is what the most important critical component of that was. If you look at the channel traditionally, most people are road warriors. They spend a lot of their time face to face with clients on the golf course, at events, at the hotel lobby bar, after the event, but they didn't know how to continue to social sell or digital market in a 
tr non-traditional norm. So we decided to create a program which would allow them to learn the four, comp the four competencies of social selling. So I encourage everyone to type this in the chat window if you're following along, www.linkedin.com forward slash sales forward slash SSI. This little URL will tell you the magic to your social selling score. If you're a, air quote, good social seller, you'll have a score of 65 or higher. If you're a great social seller, it'll be 70 or higher. It's very rare to get to 100. But if you're an amazing social seller, you'll get as far as 80, 85. And I've seen that happen multiple times with people I've coached. And it's made up of four components that are 25 points each. The first is your professional brand. So rather than look at LinkedIn as the place that resumes go to die, you can really reimagine LinkedIn as the place that you can you can also evolve your resume or your LinkedIn as a place where you can speak directly to your customers. What differentiates you from the competition? Why would they choose your company, your products and services over everybody around you? What makes you stand out from the crowd? That's the first component. And so we help people reimagine their, their talk track with their customer in mind. The second thing that we help people do is we help you find the right prospects. So that's really understanding your target audience. Who are your customers? What do they read? Who do they follow? Who influences them? This is such an important competency in understanding your channel ecosystem. So when you review this talk track, you have to think very granularly. What are my typical customers? If they're in healthcare, are they a mid-sized clinic or are they a hospital? If they are a um, financial district or manufacturing or travel and leisure or hospitality, where do they typically lie? Then you have to go a step further. What are their typical pain points? How can I help solve their pain points? Do I truly understand what their problems are? 70% of customers are more willing to talk to somebody who can help them solve their problems. It's less about you and more about them. So that's a big, a big positioning point that every channel representative really has to understand. The third competency that you really have to do is understanding if you are engaging with insights. So 75% of B2Bs, 85% of C-level executives and IT decision makers in, in C-suite are saying they review content before they even talk to a salesperson. They'll look for up to five pieces of content before they even talk to you. So what's the content they're looking for? White papers, brochures, eBooks, collateral, infographics, webinars, podcasts, third-party analyst reports, et cetera. So do you have the content that your companies are looking for? I work with a lot of different size partners, bars, MSPs. Some of them have really strong marketing departments and some don't, unfortunately. But your vendors and your distributors have a world of information that they would love to co-brand and co-market with you. So really lean in and leverage that content. Make sure that you're writing articles, that you're sharing videos, that you're providing content that will differentiate you to really be successful. And fourth, you want to make sure that you're building authentic and genuine relationships. I always ask people in our persona intake calls, what's your personality? What do you like really? And they'll say, oh, I'm really genuine. I'm really authentic. I'm really uh, responsive. And I say, when's the last time you were on LinkedIn? When's the last time you shared thought leadership? When's the last time you responded or talked to a customer prospect online or connected with them even? And they'll say, oh, I, I don't do those things. I, um, I am very professional online. I'm very this way here and I'm very that way there. So it's like you have this personality, you have this brand and you go online and you lose yourself. You lose your energy. You, you lose your authenticity. You lose what makes you who you are. And remember the old adage, people buy from people they like, that's never gonna change. So it is so critical that you remain true to yourself when you have your online persona. And if you wouldn't go a day or a week without checking your email or voicemail, you certainly shouldn't go a day without checking your social as well. It is so important because that is where our clients are today. They are there 
And remember to fish where the fish are. So when I say, what do your customers read? Do they read CRN? Do they read channel futures? Do they read channel partners? What is the material and content that they're reviewing, listening, learning from? And are you reading the same content? Are you participating or writing for the same content? Are you sharing that content? What podcasts do they listen to? There were 64 podcasts in the technology channel alone, which went up to 84 during the pandemic with very loyal listeners who typically listen to a podcast within 24 hours of it being aired. Do you listen and participate or become guests or panelists or speakers on those podcasts? Do you listen to the podcast in a social listening way that will allow you to connect and communicate with your participants in that same fashion? There are 155 technology channel events in the traditional channel. That would be cost prohibitive and time consuming to fly to all of those events. So where are your customers? You want to get the best return on investment for time and energy. So you want to participate virtually online, follow the hashtags on Twitter, show up to those events, or participate if you can get a seat at the table. So this is all very important in terms of knowing your ecosystem. And that's just in the traditional channel. When you look at ISVs and emerging tech, there's 10,000 new partners that are being formed every year. When you look at marketplaces, there was more marketplaces that were sold in one year than in the last 10 years combined. When you look at Unified Communications, Zoom sold more in March of 2020 than it did in all of fiscal year 2019. So the Rise of technology, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, unified communications, all of the things that have huge opportunities right now. If COVID did anything, it gave everybody the opportunity to pause and rethink your people, your processes, and your technology. So hopefully that can help you rise and shine in your pursuits and efforts. Now, the most important thing that I'm going to also finish this journey with you is I mentioned it earlier and my personal journey being as a woman in technology, the first in my family to go to college, the first in my family to get my MBA, the first in my family to work in technology for almost two decades. I can tell you that we have a huge problem. There has not only been a stagnation of women entering careers in technology, but a decline over the last 10 years. And recently, McKinsey reported that one in four women were leaving due to the pandemic. Lack of flexibility, feeling overwhelmed, lack of mentorship, the list went on and on. How do we stop the plug? How do we attract, retain, and promote women and diversity in technology? It is not only a feel-good effort, but it has proven over and over again to have tangible ROI and benefits. Women-owned businesses and women in leadership have better, better employee retention. You have better success metrics, you have better return on investment when angel investment in, inherits and owns them. You have a lot of um, really strong dynamics of collaboration and listening and bringing diversity of thought makes better products, better services, better workplace culture, and better communication to your end customers. So not only does it feel good, but there's a significant return on the investment and tangible results. So we want to consider those things and understand how do we make a difference? I have made this my life's mission to understand why and help fight and combat these issues. Uh, many of the issues are stemming from unconscious bias. It's one of the primary reasons that women do not get hired or diverse candidates do not get hired. It takes 11 seconds for a typical HR hiring manager to review a resume. Do you know it takes longer to pop popcorn than it takes for them to assess? This once happened in the Philharmonic where they had an inordinate amount of white males compared to 
diverse and women. And so they decided that they were going to do blind auditions. When they did that, it actually leveled out the amount of women and diversity that were now in the Philharmonic. And so the idea was that if you can take away some of the unconscious bias in terms of hiring and seeking candidates, for example, on a resume, he should have these qualities. He should possess versus they open it up a bit more ambiguously so that a candidate doesn't self-eliminate before they even have a shot at interviewing for the opportunity. That's one. Number two, imposter syndrome. There is a line that has been expressed where men typically see themselves above average and women see, typically see themselves below average. And that imposter syndrome causes a deficit where there has been a lack of support and advocacy. And one of the biggest reasons that women self-eliminate before they even get their foot in the door is lack of mentorship or lack of management support. So one in six men after the Me Too movement said that they felt comfortable mentoring women. There was a lot of reasons behind that. They were worried about scandal. They were worried about making the wrong advances. They were worried about things being misconstrued. And that is one of the biggest problems we could run into because if men are in positions of power and leadership, how can they make a difference? How can they attract or promote or groom a woman to have a seat at the bench? So when a position opens up, you not only have a mentor, but a sponsor and a champion who will go to bat and say, you need to check out this candidate. They're perfect for the position. So that is one of the largest opportunities that we can work on as a community. The other part is thinking about who you hire. If you're only hiring from Ivy League educated universities, you're missing out large portions of the population that are hungry, talented, hardworking, and could really benefit from an opportunity with given the right steps and the right guidance and mentorship. So I'd highly encourage opening diversity into your organization and not just hiring for tokenism or affirmative action sake, but truly giving people a seat at the table, truly hearing their thoughts and perspectives, because it is in our diversity that we are stronger and more powerful together. Personally, I can tell you, as somebody who was given mentorship and an opportunity, I have been able to move mountains in my career. I have been able to work at Fortune 500 companies successfully. I have been able to help hundreds of vendors, distributors, and partners become successful in an area of business and a time that was so challenging that they could have went out of work if not for having the right guidance or support. I have been able to make a difference in people's lives and help change the way the world lives, works, plays, and learns. So keep in mind when you're hiring candidates that you want to suck somebody that is willing to learn, passionate, open-minded, and wants to continue to learn every single day. We can all learn something new. And with the right advocacy and support, you will find that there's enormous potential and opportunity. And I'll leave you with a final analogy. If you look at geese, you ever wonder why they fly in that V formation? The goose in the front is flapping their wings. And as they flap their wings, they help every goose in line behind them lift and raise to an elevation to help them support them. The geese behind them honk. And the reason they do that is they're cheering on the geese in front of them. Together, they have this symbiotic relationship that helps not only help the others behind them, but helps motivate and cheer each other on. In the technology channel ecosystem, we are at a unique position and opportunity where we can talk about the opportunity to help one another, to overcome challenges, to mentor each other, to have a seat at the table, to eliminate the amount of women that are leaving careers in technology by fostering careers with flexibility, work-life balance and integration, and allowing everybody to understand what we can do to help each other be successful. It's been an honor and a privilege to talk to you today. And I encourage each and every one of you to really continue to shine in your channel journey. Know who your clients are, get to know your partners, get to know your influencers and connect with each other at a very personal level. Regardless of working globally or locally, we're all in this together and together we can make a difference. I hope you have a great day.